So it had been about three months and I finally finished The Dying Grass by William T. Volman. This is the latest volume in his Seven Dreams series. Here, here are the series so far. There's The Ice Shirt, Volume 1, Fathers and Crows, Volume 2, uh, The Rifles, which is Volume 6, and Argo, which is Volume 3. So they weren't really published in order. This is Volume 5. The, the page count on this book is like 1,356 pages, but I don't know if it's the longest volume so far. I mean, Fathers and Crows was pretty long. I, the reason why I say that is because the author employs this this um, structure, this indentation technique that introduces a lot of white space into the text. So that could blow the number of pages out. But um, in this book, this book concerns the Nez Perce Native Americans and their forced relocation, um, their conflicts with the American government, the American military, uh, the settlers, the volunteers. Uh, it's all happening within a period of months in the late 1870s around Oregon. And the, you know, the Native Americans really um, were victim to this, this rapid expansion of of uh, young America after the Civil War, and they could either defend their homeland or just concede the land, which, you know, they've been living on for thousands and thousands of years, uh, and move into uh, just a small fraction, you know, a small space like a reservation. So this this book shows that whole entire campaign of trying to um, contain these, this particular tribe, and uh, the the troops are led by General Oliver Otis Howard, who seems to have experienced some sort of embarrassment in his earlier in his uh, military career. Um, so he's keen on uh, getting the job done to impress uh, General Sherman, and you you see all the all the thought processes that this general goes through. Volman really inhabits the mind of this general like like very few writers um, I've read can do. Like maybe Norman Mailer. You know, uh, Otis Howard is just a character who you can see what his his concerns are. He's, he's, a, he's um, an open-hearted Christian and that plays a big factor in his his policies, his decision making, and and it's kind of ironic because Christianity in this period uh, seems to be more of a liability uh, if when compared to the uh, the earlier versions. Um, but there is his character, which is fascinating. Um, there is also other officers in the troop, like. Uh, Wood, who is sort of a sensitive, artistic type. Uh, Colonel Perry, I think he's a colonel, uh, who also has gone through some some sort of like, you know, humiliating experience and has to prove himself. There's uh, Howard's own son, who participates in the campaign. And you can tell the father and son are very close, but they can't really show it too much. So there's there's that dynamic in the uh, the relationship um, there's non-military folk in this troop like uh, Ad Chapman who is kind of considered a um, I guess a scoundrel character but he's very useful he's a interpreter for uh, for General Howard there's uh, another character named Doc who's this sort of sinister all pervasive presence in the story, uh, very similar um, to Argyll in uh, Volume 3. Uh, Volman calls uh, Doc Argyll's counterpart. And um, and then there's the whole Native American side, which is um, Chief Joseph and uh, White Bird and a whole array of other characters. Um, Wellwayas, I think, who is sort of like this 
transsexual or, or transvestite Native American. Um, it's interesting to see how Volman differentiates the narratives between the two sides. When he's talking on the when he's when he's describing the American side, it's very like business as usual, part of the uh, the American you know machinery bureaucracy. And what I really enjoyed about those parts w- was when you know the general would just like dress down the uh, the inferior officers, especially at Chapman. You know, like the just the language. You know, just the way the the dialogue is just kind of hilarious. Um, on the other hand, the the Native American uh, sections, those were definitely more poetic, um, you know, nature based. A lot of color in the narrative. Uh, their belief system was more, I guess it was called dreaming, based on the um, beliefs of a priest priest named Smoholly. And I, but I think Volman actually scales back his tendency to write very purplish type prose. I wish I'd read his earlier book, which was The Last Stories, or Last Stories and Other Stories, uh, fiction that was sort of meditations on death, because I think in that book, he probably was employing his more poetic language, which I do enjoy reading. Um, Here, it's it's more of a plain-spoken narrative style, and uh, this indentation technique, not not intrusive at all, really. Um, it's it's a very flexible technique. It's sort of like he can open up, you know, he'll have the main narrative, but then he can open up a secondary narrative where there's other characters kind of commenting on what's happening in the in the primary narrative, or it can be like characters jumping from like public declarations into their own. Uh, you know, interior monologues or thoughts, what they're really thinking at that time, um, or just like sound effects. Just all there's various different ways he employs uh, this paragraphing style, and I think he's trying to accomplish sort of a three dimensional snapshot of what the present reality of the narrative is, and it's very successful. It's not fractured. It's not disruptive like how some writers might use footnotes or endnotes or just opening up parentheses after parentheses um, to kind of break the primary narrative. This this works really well for me uh, and it wasn't a problem. The, the problem I had with this book was how freaking heavy it was. It was just hard to hard to read and I just jumped straight away to reading the um, the ebook version just for the sake of my <laughs> my hands. And I, I thought that would pose a problem because I read in landscape on my Kindle, so it would be about maybe half of a page. And with all this indentation happening, it really didn't pose that much of a problem. Uh, I'd say um, maybe, I don't know if they're going to make an ebook or not an ebook, an audiobook version, uh, or they already have, but I don't know how they would convey the, um, the structure in an audiobook format. But anyways... Yeah, I liked I liked this book. It's it's sort of a departure from the other volumes in that it's I guess less of a postmodern type overlay and more more sort of straightforward, very immediate story. Um, and uh, yeah, I you know it's it's definitely challenging. The first half you actually kind of get an idea of of the uh, narrative structure. Because there's sort of like this circular structure of like skirmish and then, um, you know, uh, just getting ready for the next one and moving forward, this long march. But then, you know, as the the narrative progresses in its sad downward vector, it just gets more and more interesting. And ultimately, you're left with just a very sad, poignant um uh, reading experience. I'd say for me, the vo- the rifle still is my favorite because it's so personal with um, the William the Blind character, William the Blind character. But uh, but yeah, and Fathers Fathers and Crows is also very notable. But this book, if you go, if you can read it, read it and stick with it, I think it'll stand out as uh, an extremely memorable read.